This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Betsy Bush, Marquette, Michigan, January 2006. Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux. Chapter 2 The New Margarita. On the first landing, Sorelli ran against the Comte de Chagnier, who was coming upstairs. The Count, who was generally so calm, seemed greatly excited. "'I was just going to you,' he said, taking off his hat. "'Oh, Sorelli, what an evening! And Christine Day, what a triumph!' "'Impossible!' said Meg Jeery. Six months ago she used to sing like a crock.' "'But do let us get by, my dear Count,' continues the brat with a saucy curtsy. "'We are going to inquire after a poor man who was found hanging by the neck.' Just then the acting manager came fussing past, and stopped when he heard this remark. "'What?' he exclaimed roughly. "'Have you girls heard already? "'Well, please forget about it for to-night, "'and above all don't let Monsieur Debien and Monsieur Poligny hear. "'It would upset them too much on their last day.' They all went on to the foyer of the ballet, which was already full of people. The Comte de Chagny was right. No gala performance ever equaled this one. All the great composers of the day had conducted their own works in turns. Faux and Kraus had sung, and on that evening Christine Day had revealed her true self, for the first time, to the astonished and enthusiastic audience. Junard had conducted the funeral march of a marionette, Royer his beautiful overture to Siguar, saint sian the danse macabre, and a reverie orientale, Massenet, an unpublished Hungarian march, Guiraud, his carnival, Delib, the vase lente, from Sylvia, and the pizzicati from Coppelia. Mademoiselle Kraus had sung the bolero in the Vespri Siciliani, and Mademoiselle Denis Bloch the drinking song in Lucrezia Borgia. But the real triumph was reserved for Christine Day, who had begun by singing a few passages from Romeo and Juliet. It was the first time that the young artist sang in this work of Junard, which had not been transferred to the opera, and which was revived at the Opera Comique, after it had been produced at the old theatre Lyrique, by Madame Carvelio. Those who heard her say that her voice in these passages was seraphic, but this was nothing to the superhuman notes that she gave forth in the prison scene and the final trio in Faust which she sang in the place of La Carlotta, who was ill. No one had ever heard or seen anything like it. Dai revealed a new Margarita that night, a Margarita of a splendor, a radiance hitherto unsuspected. The whole house went mad, rising to its feet, shouting, cheering, clapping, while Christine sobbed and fainted in the arms of her fellow singers, and had to be carried to her dressing-room. A few subscribers, however, protested. Why had so great a treasure been kept from them all that time? Till then Christine Day had played a good sibyl to Carlotta's rather too splendidly material Margarita, and it had needed Carlotta's incomprehensible and inexcusable absence from this gala night for the little Day, at a moment's warning, to show all that she could do in a part of the program reserved for the Spanish diva. Well, what the subscribers wanted to know was, why had Debienne and Poligny applied to Dai when Carlotta was taken ill? Did they know of her hidden genius? And if they knew of it, why had they kept it hidden? And why had she kept it hidden? Oddly enough, she was not known to have a professor of singing at that moment. She had often said she meant to practice alone for the future. The whole thing was a mystery. The Comte de Chagny, standing up in his box, listened to all this frenzy, and took part in it by loudly applauding. Philippe-Georges-Marie Comte de Chagny was just forty-one years of age. He was a great aristocrat, and a good-looking man. 
above middle height, and with attractive features, in spite of his hard forehead and rather cold eyes. He was exquisitely polite to the women, and a little haughty to the men, who did not always forgive him for his successes in society. He had an excellent heart and an irreproachable conscience. On the death of old Count Philibert, he became the head of one of the oldest and most distinguished families in France, whose arms dated back to the fourteenth century. The Chagnys owned a great deal of property, and when the old Count, who was a widower, died, it was no easy task for Philippe to accept the management of so large an estate. His two sisters and his brother Raoul would not hear of a division, and waived their claim to their shares, leaving themselves entirely in Philippe's hands, as though the right of primogeniture had never ceased to exist. When the two sisters married on the same day, they received their portion from their brother, not as a thing rightfully belonging to them, but as a dowry for which they thanked him. The Comtesse de Chagny, née de Montrogis de la Martiniere, had died in giving birth to Raoul, who was born twenty years after his elder brother. At the time of the old Count's death, Raoul was twelve years of age. Philippe busied himself actively with the youngster's education. He was admirably assisted in this work first by his sisters, and afterward by an old aunt, and widow of a naval officer, who lived at Brest and gave young Raoul a taste for the sea. The lad entered the Borda training ship, finished his course with honors, and quietly made his trip around the world. Thanks to powerful influence, he had just been appointed a member of the official expedition on board the Requin, which was to be sent to the Arctic Circle in search of the survivors of the D'Artois expedition, of whom nothing had been heard for three years. Meanwhile he was enjoying a long furlough which would not be over for six months, and already the dowagers of the Faubourg Saint-Germain were pitying the handsome and apparently delicate stripling for the hard work in store for him. The shyness of the sailor lad, I was almost saying his innocence, was remarkable. He seemed to have but just left the women's apron strings. As a matter of fact, petted as he was by his two sisters and his old aunt, he had retained from this purely feminine education manners that were almost candid and stamped with a charm that nothing had yet been able to sully. He was a little over twenty-one years of age and looked eighteen. He had a small, fair moustache, beautiful blue eyes, and a complexion like a girl's. Philippe spoiled Raoul. To begin with, he was very proud of him, and pleased to foresee a glorious career for his junior in the navy in which one of his ancestors, the famous Chagny de la Roche, had held the rank of admiral. He took advantage of the young man's leave of absence to show him Paris, with all its luxurious and artistic delights. The Count considered that, at Raoul's age, it is not good to be too good. Philippe himself had a character that was very well balanced in work and pleasure alike. His demeanor was always faultless, and he was incapable of setting his brother a bad example. He took him with him wherever he went. He even introduced him to the foyer of the ballet. I know that the Count was said to be on terms with Sorelli but it could hardly be reckoned as a crime for this nobleman, a bachelor with plenty of leisure, especially since his sisters were settled, to come and spend an hour or two after dinner in the company of a dancer, who, though not so very, very witty, had the finest eyes that were ever seen. And besides, there are places where a true Parisian, when he has the rank of the Comte de Chagny, is bound to show himself, and at that time the foyer of the ballet at the opera was one of those places. Lastly, Philippe would perhaps not have taken his brother behind the scenes of the opera, if Raoul had not been the first to ask him, repeatedly renewing his request with a gentle obstinacy which the Count remembered at a later date. On that evening, Philippe, after applauding the day, turned to Raoul and saw that he was quite pale. "'Don't you see,' said Raoul, "'that the woman's fainting.' "'You look like fainting yourself,' said the Count." "'What's the matter?' But Raoul had recovered himself, and was standing up. "'Let's go and see,' he said. "'She never sang like that before.' The Count gave his brother a curious, smiling glance, and seemed quite pleased. 
They were soon at the door leading from the house to the stage. Numbers of subscribers were slowly making their way through. Raoul tore his gloves without knowing what he was doing, and Philippe had much too kind a heart to laugh at him for his impatience. But he now understood why Raoul was absent-minded when spoken to, and why he always tried to turn every conversation to the subject of the opera. They reached the stage, and pushed through the crowd of gentlemen, scene-shifters, supers, and chorus-girls, Raoul leading the way, feeling that his heart no longer belonged to him, his face set with passion, while Count Philippe followed him with difficulty, and continued to smile. At the back of the stage Raoul had to stop before the inrush of the little troop of ballet girls who blocked the passage which he was trying to enter. More than one chafing phrase darted from little made-up lips, to which he did not reply, and at last he was able to pass, and dived into the semi-darkness of a corridor ringing with the name of Day, Day. The Count was surprised to find that Raoul knew the way. He had never taken him to Christine's himself, and came to the conclusion that Raoul must have gone there alone while the Count stayed talking in the foyer with Sorelli, who often asked him to wait until it was her time to go on, and sometimes handed him the little gaiters in which she ran down from her dressing-room to preserve the spotlessness of her satin dancing-shoes and her flesh-colored tights. Sorelli had an excuse. She had lost her mother. Postponing his usual visit to Sorelli for a few minutes, the Count followed his brother down the passage that led to Daae's dressing-room, and saw that it had never been so crammed as on that evening, when the whole house seemed excited by her success, and also by her fainting-fit. For the girl had not yet come to, and the doctor of the theatre had just arrived at the moment when Raoul entered at his heels. Christine, therefore, received the first aid of the one, while opening her eyes in the arms of the other. The Count and many more remained crowding in the doorway. "'Don't you think, doctor, that those gentlemen had better clear the room?' asked Raoul coolly. "'There's no breathing here.' "'You're quite right,' said the doctor. And he sent every one away, except Raoul and the maid, who looked at Raoul with eyes of the most undisguised astonishment. She had never seen him before, and yet dared not question him and the doctor imagined that the young man was only acting as he did because he had the right to. The Viscount, therefore, remained in the room watching Christine as she slowly returned to life, while even the joint managers, Dibien and Poligny, who had come to offer their sympathy and congratulations, found themselves thrust into the passage among the crowd of dandies. The Comte de Chagny, who was one of those standing outside, laughed, oh the rogue the rogue and he added under his breath those youngsters with their schoolgirl airs so he is a chagny after all he turned to go to sorelli's dressing-room but met her on the way with her little troop of trembling ballet girls as we have seen meanwhile christine day uttered a deep sigh which was answered by a groan she turned her head saw raoul and started she looked at the doctor on whom she bestowed a smile then at her maid, then at Raoul again. Monsieur, she said, in a voice not much above a whisper, who are you? Mademoiselle, replied the young man, kneeling on one knee, and pressing a fervent kiss on the diva's hand. I am the little boy who went in the sea to rescue your scarf. Christine again looked at the doctor and the maid, and all three began to laugh. Raoul turned very red and stood up. Mademoiselle, he said, since you are pleased not to recognize me, I should like to say something to you in private, something very important. When I am better, do you mind? And her voice shook. You have been very good. Yes, you must go, said the doctor, with his pleasantest smile. Leave me to attend to Mademoiselle. I am not ill now, said Christine suddenly, with strange and unexpected energy. She rose and pressed her hand over her eyelids. "'Thank you, doctor. I should like to be alone. Please go away, all of you. Leave me. I feel very restless this evening.' The doctor tried to make a short protest, but perceiving the girl's evident agitation, he thought the best remedy was not to thwart her, and he went away, saying to Raoul outside, "'She is not herself to-night. She is usually so gentle.' Then he said good-night, and Raoul was left alone. The whole of this part of the theatre was now deserted. The farewell ceremony was no doubt taking place in the foyer of the ballet. 
Raoul thought that Daae might go to it, and he waited in the silent solitude, even hiding in the favoring shadow of a doorway. He felt a terrible pain at his heart, and it was of this that he wanted to speak to Daae without to delay. Suddenly the dressing-room door opened, and the maid came out by herself, carrying bundles. He stopped her and asked her how her mistress was. The woman laughed and said that she was quite well, and that he must not disturb her, for she wished to be alone, and she passed on. One idea alone filled Raoul's burning brain. Of course Daae wished to be left alone, for him. Had he not told her that he wanted to speak to her privately? Hardly breathing, he went up to the dressing-room, and, with his ear to the door to catch her reply, prepared to knock. But his hand dropped. He had heard a man's voice in the dressing-room, saying, in a curiously masterful tone, "'Christine, you must love me!' And Christine's voice, infinitely sad and trembling, as though accompanied by tears, replied, "'How can you talk like that, when I sing only for you?' Raoul leaned against the panel to ease his heart. His heart, which had seemed gone for ever, returned to his breast and was throbbing loudly. The whole passage echoed with its beating, and Raoul's ears were deafened. Surely, if his heart continued to make such a noise, they would hear it inside. They would open the door, and the young man would be turned away in disgrace. What a position for a chagnier, to be caught listening behind a door! He took his heart in his two hands to make it stop. The man's voice spoke again. "'Are you very tired?' "'Oh, to-night I gave you my soul, and I am dead,' Christine replied. "'Your soul is a beautiful thing, child,' replied the grave man's voice, "'and I thank you. No emperor ever received so fair a gift. The angels wept to-night.' Raoul heard nothing after that. Nevertheless, he did not go away, but— as though he feared lest he should be caught, he returned to his dark corner, determined to wait for the man to leave the room. At one and the same time he had learned what love meant, and hatred. He knew that he loved. He wanted to know whom he hated. To his great astonishment, the door opened, and Christine Daae appeared, wrapped in furs, with her face hidden in a lace veil, alone. She closed the door behind her, but Raoul observed that she did not lock it. She passed him. He did not even follow her with his eyes, for his eyes were fixed on the door, which did not open again. When the passage was once more deserted, he crossed it, opened the door of the dressing-room, went in and shut the door. He found himself in absolute darkness. The gas had been turned out. "'There is someone here,' said Raoul, with his back against the closed door in a quivering voice. "'What are you hiding for?' All was darkness and silence. Raoul heard only the sound of his own breathing. He quite failed to see that the indiscretion of his conduct was exceeding all bounds. "'You shan't leave this until I let you,' he exclaimed. "'If you don't answer, you are a coward, but I'll expose you.' And he struck a match. The blaze lit up the room. There was no one in the room. Raoul, first turning the key in the door, lit the gas jets. He went into the dressing-closet, opened the cupboards, hunted about, felt the walls with his moist hands. Nothing. "'Look here,' he said aloud. "'Am I going mad?' He stood for ten minutes, listening to the gas flaring in the silence of the empty room. Lover though he was, he did not even think of stealing a ribbon that would have given him the perfume of the woman he loved. He went out, not knowing what he was doing nor where he was going. At a given moment in his wayward progress, an icy draught struck him in the face. He found himself at the bottom of a staircase, down which, behind him, a procession of workmen were carrying a sort of stretcher, covered with a white sheet. "'Which is the way out, please?' he asked of one of the men. "'Straight in front of you. The door is open. But let us pass.' Pointing to the stretcher, he said mechanically, "'What's that?' The workmen answered, "'That?' is Joseph Pouquet, who was found in the third cellar, hanging between a farmhouse and a scene from the Roi de la Croix. He took off his hat, fell back to make room for the procession, and went out. End of chapter 2